Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next chapter in our series of aquaculture-related webinars designed to bring together science and business to expand and strengthen the United States aquaculture industry. These webinars are a joint effort between the National Aquaculture Association, the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center, and the United States Aquaculture Society. Whether you're currently engaged in aquaculture, looking to get into business, an educator helping others understand aquaculture, or you just want to become a better educated consumer. We hope that these webinars will enhance your knowledge and move you forward on your journey to success. Today's webinar is presented by Linda Odierno. Linda is well known and highly respected in the world of seafood and is now serving as the outreach specialist with the National Aquaculture Association. Linda was instrumental in getting these webinars started to begin with, and for that, we are grateful. Today's topic is geared towards seafood retailers and food service providers and is titled U.S. Farm-Raised Fin Fish and Shellfish 101. Over 50% of today's seafood destined for consumption comes from aquaculture, and it's important that those working on the front lines with customers and consumers understand aquaculture and where it fits into the seafood picture. Linda will provide an overview of U.S. aquaculture and illustrate how it can help you meet your needs to provide safe, sustainable, and local seafood for your customers. And for those of you that might be interested, our next webinar will air on September 27th and feature distinguished aquaculture economist, Dr. Carol Engel, talking about the economic impact of aquaculture regulations. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Linda. Take it away. Welcome everyone. A couple of housekeeping details before we start. If you have questions, simply type them into the chat box on your screen. And we'll go back to those questions at the end of the program. Let's start at the very beginning. What is aquaculture? Aquaculture or fish farming is the production of aquatic animals and plants under controlled conditions for all or for part of the life cycle. If we look at the kinds of products that we are producing, everybody thinks about food, but actually U.S. aquaculture produces many other products. We have plants for food and seaweed salad is an up and comer in all the restaurants and hip places. Ornamental plants for backyard ponds for remediation, bait fish and sport fish, wildlife restoration, companion animals, and that's really politically correct speak for pets, and biological controls. The fish on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen is a gambusia or mosquito fish. These are used to control mosquitoes, and these are very important now as we have Zika on the rise. Medical research, most major research facilities have aquariums and they raise fish as model species for different types of medical research, amphibians and reptiles. I included a piece of coral on this. A lot of people like coral or live rock for their aquaria and aquaculture is one way that we can provide those products without harming a very fragile, very biodiverse environment. So we have lots of different types of products that are being produced. How are we producing them? Well, probably the oldest form is in ponds. Ponds were being used by the ancient Egyptians. The Chinese was a way to rear fish, increase the supply of what was available. Catfish, tilapia, red drum, hybrid striped bass are all species that are raised in ponds. As we move along, we have tanks, and tanks are interesting because they can be located almost anywhere. The water is recirculated through the system, it's pumped out, it's cleaned, and then pumped back into the system. So it's very effective from water use standpoints, and also locations. Tanks can be put in abandoned buildings, old warehouses, desert environments. The Israelis do a lot of work in the desert. So this is another type of aquaculture facility that we can be using. 
raceways, fish that like to live in moving high oxygenated water are very often raised in raceways where the water flows through the system. And then it goes back into a natural body of water. The effluent leaving those systems must be the same or better quality than the receiving water. So this is very heavily regulated, does not cause any kind of environmental degradation. Trout are very often raised in raceways. Net pens are used for salmon, and salmon is probably one of the most popular fish at the retail counter. These salmon pens are located off the coast, and they are sometimes controversial. One of the techniques that the aquaculture industry is looking into is called integrated multitrophic aquaculture. What that means is in the area of the net pens, you have shellfish, you have seaweeds growing. So what you're doing is you're actually recycling the nutrients through that environment. So this is a very environmentally sound way of producing those salmon in the net pens that are not too far from shore. And the state of Maine is doing a lot of work in this area. So it's a natural biological system. Nutrients are moving through, being used by the different organisms. Very often we hear about wild salmon versus farm-raised salmon. Actually, a very large percentage of that salmon that we buy as wild salmon starts its life in a hatchery. It's raised in the hatchery, then it's allowed to swim freely in the ocean, and then it's harvested. Sometimes this is called ocean ranching, but it's one of the reasons that we have all that Atlantic salmon available. Open ocean is probably one of the most effective ways of producing fish. These cages are located far from shore. They are in deep water. When the cages are not being maintained or worked on, they actually submerge below the water. You wouldn't even know that that cage was there. It just disappears under the water column. You have the natural flush, controlled environment. You have currents that are moving material. So you avoid a lot of the problems that we have on the near shore side. Shellfish aquaculture, if you look at oysters, actually the ancient Romans were the first to do oyster aquaculture. They were very big fans of oysters. Pretty much when you talk about shellfish aquaculture, what you're doing is you're protecting the organisms from predators. Oysters are raised in floating rafts or on racks, and they actually are submerged when the tide comes in. This allows the shells to harden, gives you a better quality product. Clams tend to live on the bottom. So the clams are raised in a hatchery and then they're planted. And there are screens that are put over the clams to protect them again from predators. Mussels are probably one of the oldest forms of aquaculture. And that's simply done on a piece of rope. The young mussel spat attaches to the rope and it grows in the water column. This is good because you get a nicer product. It's not sandy, doesn't have the pearls in it that you sometimes find in wild harvest mussels. The one in the right hand corner is the gooey duck. Gooey ducks start life in a hatchery like all the other shellfish, but then are planted in PVC pipes that are submerged in the mud. And the top is actually covered by a wire mesh. Again, protection against predators. When the gooey duck gets large enough, the PVC pipe is removed and the gooey duck grows on its own. So shellfish aquaculture, extremely popular. It also has a lot of beneficial effects on the environment because these organisms are filter feeders, 
they can remove nutrients from the water and they use those nutrients to grow. Also, some species tend to spawn at least once before they're harvested. That helps to reseed natural beds. I threw in a quick question here. The most commonly farmed fish in the world is, and a lot of people say Atlantic salmon because that's such a big seller, but actually it's the carp. Carp is extremely popular in Eastern Europe, in Asian countries, so that's the number one fish, and it's used in a lot of ethnic cuisines. Some of the common species we have here are the Atlantic salmon. And Atlantic salmon would be pretty much extinct if it wasn't for aquaculture. There are very few wild Atlantic salmon. And so it's one way to bring this species that's very popular with consumers to the public in large quantities. Rainbow trout. Prevention Magazine in July had an article about the safest and most sustainable fish and they said it was rainbow trout. So rainbow trout is really on the forefront of the news. Rachel Ray features rainbow trout in her September issue as one of the fish we should be consuming more often. Red drum, when Paul Prudhomme had his big promotion about black and red fish, a lot of the red drum was overfished. Now we have a supply coming from aquaculture and we hope that that supply is going to increase. Of course, most people are familiar with tilapia. We have catfish in the south and hybrid striped bass. Hybrid striped bass is interesting because in some states like New Jersey, it's illegal to sell true striped bass, but you can sell a hybrid striped bass. So that broadens the market for these products. Some of the other species, things like cod and Atlantic halibut, there's a lot of work going on to figure out how we can farm these species that are extremely popular but aren't in the supply that they used to be. Sturgeon, fish used for caviar and for sturgeon meat and for smoked sturgeon. Again, it's a fish that's kind of tottering on the edge, but if we can start to farm more sturgeon, we'll have more supply available. Cobia, very popular fish in Asia. It's a beautiful looking fish, great tasting. Barramundi is becoming more popular. A lot of the wholesale clubs are selling it. And tuna. For a long time, what they were doing is they would simply harvest tuna and then fatten it up in pens. Now there are some researchers who believe that they have closed the life cycle and will be able to produce tuna in farms the same as the other fish. If you look at oysters, we have five species of oysters in the U.S the eastern oyster and the Olympia oyster on the west coast are actually native to the United States. Pacific oysters and kumamotos were imported from Asia and they are now being grown on the west coast. The European flat or Balan oyster is from France and it's a very strong tasting oyster People who like it just love it. So it's a popular product. When we talk about oysters, in addition to the species that we have, we see names like Apalachicolas, Blue Points. And where that comes from is the water that they are raised in. You may have heard of the term terroir, which is used for land plants, things like coffee and wine grapes. They have different flavors depending upon what soil the coffee and the wine grapes were raised in. Well, to change that to the ocean, we call it Mirwa. And that's where we get all these small regional names like Delaware Bays. Sustainability is on everybody's mind, but no one really has a real clear definition. What do we mean when we talk about sustainability? We mean that we can 
meet our current resource needs without negatively impacting the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So in simple terms, it's wise use of natural resources and maintain environmental integrity. But I kind of like to go beyond that when I talk about sustainability. And we have a food security issue. Over 90% of the seafood we consume in this country is imported product. We need to do a better job of raising product here in the US. There's a social need. It's a very healthy food. A lot of different ethnic groups feature different fish and shellfish in their celebrations and their cuisine. So there's a social component to this. And then of course, there's an economic component. Money earned on fish farms tends to stay in those communities. So someone who's working on a fish farm is gonna eat lunch at the local restaurant. They're gonna buy gas at the local gas station. So it helps the entire community. So fish farming in the US is sustainable. We have a whole slew of regulations here. We have federal regulations, state regulations, and in many cases, we have local regulations. And those cover a variety of different issues, and they are monitored by a number of federal and state agencies. It's not only getting the licensing and starting a fish farm, it's also that constant record keeping, constantly making sure that your product is raised to the highest standards for both sustainability and for product safety. Every five years, USDA and Health and Human Services comes out with a publication called the Dietary Guidelines. And to substantiate their recommendations, they have a scientific committee. Well, this year's committee was very strongly pro-aquaculture. And they make this statement. If you look at sustainability, fin fish, and now they're talking about higher trophic level fin fish, salmon and trout, is more sustainable than terrestrial animal production in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, land and water use. With a growing population, we need to look at ways to produce protein in the most effective and efficient manner possible while still catering to people's tastes. If you look at the publications from the different environmental groups, they very often rate the best fish as being farmed, and they very often will say farmed in the US because we have such strenuous regulations. People are concerned about the use of antibiotics and hormones in farm-raised fish. Well, actually in the United States, it is illegal to use growth or production hormones. You cannot add hormones to fish to make them grow faster in the US. You can't promote growth with antibiotics. You can't use pesticides and very few drugs have been approved. And we do have to have drugs because it's a question of animal welfare. If the fish become sick, we need to be able to treat them. But one of the major tenets of U.S. aquaculture is to keep the fish in the best possible environment. Because the less stress you have on your fish, fewer disease issues you're going to have. Well, FDA came out with a mercury advisory. And we did a survey of over 1,000 seafood consumers across the U.S. And we asked if they ever heard anything negative about seafood, and if so, what was it? Well, 65% of our sample said yes, they'd heard negative stuff, and it was mercury. So the mercury advisory came out. People didn't understand it. A lot of people stopped eating fish. So they were listening to reports on the radio, on the television, 
that didn't give a clear perspective. So after the Mercury Advisory was issued, a lot of research came out and they found that women who eat seafood during pregnancy had healthier babies. So they had to backtrack a little bit on this. If we look at the Mercury Advisory, and this is what everybody asks about. Dietitians ask me about this all the time. Doctors, because they don't really understand what it means. The Mercury Advisory is for a very specific target audience. Pregnant women, nursing mothers, women who may become pregnant, and small children. That's the target audience. It doesn't apply to men. It doesn't apply to older women, doesn't apply to 12 year olds. And these are the fish that should be avoided. King mackerel, tilefish, swordfish, and shark. But it's only by that target audience. And if you look at these fish and think about, well, what was the last time I had one of these? I really like swordfish, but the price is just too high to have it on a regular basis. So those are the only four fish that are restricted and only for that target audience. The next proviso is limit the consumption of albacore tuna to six ounces per week. One of the questions that I get when I talk about this is, well, a lot of the food assistance programs allow you to buy tuna. Yes, you can buy tuna, but it's chunk light tuna, which is skipjack. It's a different species. It doesn't have that mercury problem. FDA recommends some low mercury fish and shellfish, and a lot of those, including the ones on this list, are farm-raised shrimp, channel catfish, tilapia, trout, and salmon. You have trout and salmon, they're really high in those omega-3 fatty acids. So that's the mercury advisory. Everyone should be able to explain it. Well, back to where FDA was. They looked at all of these studies and they found that there was some really well-documented benefits of consuming seafood during pregnancy. They looked at toddlers whose mothers ate fish fish, and they found that they had better visual, cognitive, and motor development. They also looked at the nutritional content of the breast milk, and it was better with those mothers who were eating fish. Some of the emerging benefits, carrying babies to full term, some of that depression that surrounds birth is lessened, seems to be lower body fat, and an improved immune response. So this was really the basis for the 2010 dietary guidelines. And that was carried forward in the 2015 to 2020 dietary guidelines. The bad news is that about 50% of the American population has chronic diseases that are related to diet, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, overweight and obesity. We're only eating about half of the seafood we should be consuming. And this last statement I think is interesting because people sometimes have the idea that wild harvest fish are more nutritious. Actually in terms of EPA and DHA, those important omega-3 fatty acids, the farm fish had as much or more than the wild harvest. So that's one question that's pretty easy to answer and it is in the dietary guidelines. Well, mentioned cardiovascular disease and that remains the leading cause of death in the United States. What happens is as we eat a diet that's high in fats and cholesterol, we tend to get deposits on the arteries. And they used to think that this was a natural process of aging, but they did a bunch of studies 
on young soldiers who lost their lives in Vietnam and found that they had these cholesterol deposits in the arteries. What we need to do is we need to get oxygen around all the tissues in the body, to the heart tissue and to the brain in particular. And that oxygen is carried by the red blood cells. If we start to build up deposits of plaque along the arteries, we narrow the channel those red blood cells can pass through, and we break down some of that elasticity in the arterial walls. So our cells aren't getting the oxygen that they need. Omega-3 fatty acids in fish can actually have a positive effect on breaking down those cholesterol deposits. So that's one of the most important reasons to eat fish and seafood at least twice a week. <clears throat> what are omega-3 fatty acids, DHA and EPA doing? They tend to boost the good cholesterol, which we need especially for nervous function, and they lower the bad cholesterol, reduces the level of triglycerides, and the red blood cells, because they are involved in the clotting process, tend to stick together. So the omega-3 fatty acids lower the stickiness, can stabilize a regular heartbeat, and lower blood pressure. So we have a lot of really important cardiovascular benefits from seafood consumption. We look at a typical American diet, we're only eating about 44% of the seafood we should be eating. But if you look at the things we should eat less of, calories from sofas. Sofas are solid fats and added sugars. Those are primarily processed foods. Refined grains, sodium, and saturated fat. So if you're eating a seafood meal, you're probably substituting it for some meal that would be higher in those products that should be limited. Seafood is an incredibly nutrient-dense food, and that's a phrase that everyone who's trying to promote seafood should know. It's incredibly nutrient-dense. Well, who says that we should be eating all these seafoods? Well, in addition to USDA and Health and Human Services, we have all of these groups have come out with positive statements about consuming more seafood. We have the American Optometric Association on this list because seafood consumption seems to play a positive role in decreasing the incidence of macular de degeneration as people age. So that's another important benefit. One of the statements in the scientific report that supports the dietary guidelines is that we're going to have to expand our supply of seafood. We're going to have to increase the amount of farms that are producing seafood here in the U.S. This chart shows seafood that's consumed in the United States. Over 90% is imported product. 2.5% is U.S. farm. 6.5% is wild caught. That's because for both the wild sector and the farm sector, there are all kinds of regulations and rules to make sure that these resources remain available. So we're not producing that much here at home. And we should be increasing the supplies that we have from U.S. farmed fish. This chart looks at who's producing fish and what kind of resources they have. Of course, you see China there with a huge fish. They are producing a lot of product. USA has a little minnow in the corner, but yet we have a tremendous amount of land and water area we could be using for fish farming. One of the things that's gonna happen in the future is both China and India, large producers of farm-raised fish, have a growing middle class. More of that product is gonna be staying at home, less is gonna be available for export to the US. We look at some other questions that consumers commonly have. We had a lot of press about aqua bounty salmon. 
Aquabounty salmon is actually has a piece of DNA from cusp, a cusp that is spliced into it. What that piece of DNA does is it allows the salmon to produce growth hormone all year round. Under normal circumstances, salmon are not producing growth hormone in the winter, so they are not growing. These two fish are the same age. The top one is an aqua bounty fish. The bottom one is a normal farm-raised fish. So the aqua bounty, the GMO fish, are sterile. They're not going to reproduce. It's kind of interesting because you hear people who complain about GMO products, and then the next time they turn around, they go down to the health food store and they buy human growth hormone capsules. Well, we do have only one GMO fish in the United States, and that's this little glowfish that you put in your aquarium. It's not something that's gonna show up on the dinner table. So we have the glowfish, and feel free to put it in your aquarium. Another question that we get from consumers a lot is what about the red color in salmon? Well, in the wild, plankton has astaxanthin in it. That's what gives it the red color. Shrimp and other small crustaceans eat the plankton and then the salmon consumes those crustaceans. And the astaxanthin from the plankton moves into the salmon. So that's what happens in the wild. That's why we have that really nice color. What happens in farm-raised products is you can get astaxanthin from two different sources. One, a natural source. The other is a synthetic, much like the vitamins that you take every morning. So the astaxanthin is produced, it's added to the feed, and it goes into the, the salmon, and that's what gives it that nice red color. And we tend to eat with our eyes, so we like that red color. When the industry first petitioned FDA to use astaxanthin, they petitioned on the basis that it was a colorant. If they had petitioned on the idea that it was a food additive, it would have been a much simpler process. And it is a food additive. The salmon needs that astaxanthin. It's a very strong antioxidant. And again, some people are concerned about farmed fish, but then they go and take astaxanthin tablets every day. One thing that we do want people to know about is high-risk individuals, anyone who is in any way immune, immune compromised, anyone who is being treated for cancer, anyone who has liver disease, AIDS, HIV, should not consume raw or partially cooked shellfish or fish. And this goes for pregnant women as well. If you cook the product, you kill the bacteria that could be problematic, and those are naturally occurring bacteria. They're nothing that was added to the water. They occur in the marine environment on a regular basis. So this message is out on shellfish tags, it's out on labels, and it's something that the industry wants people to know because no one wants people to get sick. Well, what are the attributes of U.S. farm-raised seafood? We have environmentally sound production methods, product safety, consistency in price, consistency in supply, which is an important issue. We again can have local production. We talked about those tanks. They can be in urban buildings. They can be located almost anywhere. And we have product quality. And this is a phrase I always like to end on because this is a quote from a person who got a lot of folks of my generation involved in aquaculture and fisheries. And every time I use this with college level groups, only the instructors recognize Jacques Cousteau, but he recognized that we have to start farming the sea. We have to have that great high quality protein. 
So what I would invite you to do is recorded webinars are available on these three websites. Please visit the NAA website. We have a really nice short video from Dr. Darius Mosafarian, who is the Dean of Public Health and Nutrition at Tufts. And he talks about the benefits of seafood consumption. It's a good little video to use with different groups. If you have any questions, we can try to answer them. <laughs>